come see the Portland Art Museum's new exhibit where they're showcasing the vibrant, surreal, and playful energy of rock concert posters and fashion from 1960s San Francisco. Aptly named Psychedelic Rock Posters and Fashion of the 1960s, this collection of nearly 200 posters and eclectic vintage fashion is on display through the end of March next year. But you can also check the Portland Art Museum calendar for lectures, movies, and more related to the Psychedelic Posters exhibit at portlandartmuseum.org. Hey Portland, are you ready to vote? The League of Women Voters has reliable, nonpartisan information about what's on your ballot. You can watch candidate interviews, listen to podcasts, read balanced explanations of ballot measures, and even learn more about ranked choice voting, which seems like a thing we all need to do. Go to lwvpdx.org or to vote411.org, and there you can view just the candidates and measures on your ballot. Vote with confidence with LWVP. PDX.org. Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking through Measure 119's push to help cannabis workers unionize, the investigation into Commissioner Renee Gonzalez's violation of campaign finance laws, and why regional leaders are all upset with three city commissioners not named Carmen Rubio. And joining me on this week's Friday News Roundup are Willamette Week cannabis reporter and author Brianna Wheeler and our very own producer Julia Fiaioni. It's Friday, October 25th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to the Friday News Roundup. Brianna, Julia, thank you for hanging out with me this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Brianna, it's been a minute. It has. I think it's been like two and a half minutes. It's too many minutes. <laughs> it's too many minutes. <laughs> for those of you new to the show, glad you're here. Today is the day we break down some of the biggest local stories of the week with some of the best and brightest journalists in town. And before we jump into the news, I usually ask an opening question so our listeners can get to know our guests a little better. But since we are a daily podcast, there's a possibility you're still catching up on all the shows this week. So Julie and I are going to quickly fill you in on what you missed. This is also for all of our regular listeners who just drop in on Friday. We know who you are. Yeah. So to catch y'all up. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost a spit take. That was very almost a spit take. We just so you know, we don't know who you are. That was, we, we don't, we don't, we don't. We're still going to catch you up. So This week, we continued our election coverage, and on Monday, Claudia spoke with Willamette Week City Hall reporter Sophie Peel about city council candidates running for District 4. And that's the area covering all of West Portland and part of Inner Southeast, including Selwood. Yeah, and we discussed how poorly paid journalists are and Mm -hmm. who's leading in individual contributions on that race. On Tuesday, our executive producer, John Atariani, joined me to do the same thing, except we discussed the city council candidates running for District 2, which are the candidates running for all of North and Inner Northeast Portland. Spoiler alert, they're all qualified and would do a great job. It's really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Also this week, we started revisiting our series of mayoral interviews. We're releasing them in alphabetical order. And we taped them back in the summer, but... John and Claudia are jumping in at the top of the episode to bring you up to speed with all that's happened since the summer uh, with all the candidates. And on Wednesday, we kicked off our conversation with Commissioner Renee Gonzalez. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed talking with Renee Gonzalez, no matter what you think of his policies. I know, Brianna. Uh, No matter what you think (laughs) of his policies, the man is well-spoken and charming, and he's got a great head of hair. And no matter what, no one can take that away from him. Not even you, Brianna. Oh, my God. That was almost another spit take. (laughs) Take it easy on me. And there was nothing in your mouth. (laughs) (laughs) And this Thursday, we re-aired my convo with Commissioner Mingus Maps, which honestly, if you haven't heard it, I highly recommend you do so. I, for one, found the conversation very illuminating. Yeah, you know, I have to agree. Even just in putting these episodes together again, listening through has been so helpful for me. Because I don't know about y'all, I still don't know who I'm voting for. So it's been really clarifying. And really, if you don't? haven't yet, I don't. Really I really don't? don't. I'm giving it the time. I, I haven't even submitted my ballot yet. No, nothing. Okay. 
<laughs> but honestly, if you haven't heard them yet, I really, I really do recommend giving them a listen. It may help you decide. And all of this brings me to our opening question. If you've been following local news this week, you might have heard that Sherry's, the 24-hour diner, is closing all of its 17 remaining Oregon locations. The closures began earlier this year when they dwindled down from 42 to the last 17. So oh, many wow. are not My shocked. Heart. I know, it's so many. But it's still really sad. If you're not from Oregon, this is a homegrown chain founded in Hermiston in 1978. It was like a Marie Callender's meets a Denny's. They were known for their pies. And also, I didn't know this, their video lottery, which I wasn't aware. Uh, it was reported that just last year, collectively, the chain generated more than $34 million in revenue for the Oregon lottery. So my opening question to you is, have you been to a Sherry's? And if you have, what is your fondest memory? You are also free to give a short, heartfelt eulogy. <laughs> that's for me. I know that's for me. <laughs> Go on. I love Sherry's. And what's funny is that I, I didn't grow up in Oregon. I didn't even know what Sherry's was prior to just a couple years ago. I, in my head, still call it Shari's, which is like totally <laughs> not it. do that? <laughs> Just because it's spelled would, that way. See, no, it's not. It's spelled Sherry's. <laughs> Just think about it for three seconds. Good old Shari's. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Rhymes with pies. Anyway. Sorry, Julie, go on. Sorry, I'm sorry. That was a... So, who jumps into someone's eulogy? I'm so sorry. Miss, Miss Cher, <laughs> love that lady. She saved me one time because if y'all are listeners of the show, you know that we all work remotely. And I decided, hey, I'm just going to work in Ben for the day. And I set up at a motel, which is a bad idea because they have awful internet, I come to learn. So I instead went and set up at a Sherry's for like eight hours and spent the whole day working there. And they did not bug me at all. They just kept refilling my coffee. It was like the most pleasant experience. I did not look well and they were just there to take care of me. So I will forever love that place. Oh, What about you, Brianna? Uh, dearly beloved. We are gathered here today <laughs> to say goodbye to our beloved chain, Shari's. 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 So I also did not grow up here, so I don't have that homegrown connection. But my nonverbal son is like obsessed with um, typography and logos. Mm. Mm. And he started like obsessing over Shari's logo, which is just their name, like in a nice script font. Mm -hmm. And he perfected that script and he would draw his own Sherry signs and wow. like hang them oh, up all around that. the house. So when we finally figured out like, oh, we got to like take him to a to a Sherry. Mm -hmm. We got to do the got to do the thing. So we went. And he's a crazy picky eater, eats nothing, but was so thrilled to be there. The food was not um, top mean, shelf. I'm just going to put that don't out there. Don't talk about it. OK, we don't care about that. We'll not disrespect <laughs> the name too much. But but also like he could we could go in there and, uh, you know, my husband and I would sit and have maybe a piece of pie and Rainier, our son, would just wild out. He was having the best time of his life, running back and forth and kind of like what Julia is saying, like they just kind of let us exist there. Mm -hmm. And no shade, no side eyes, no, please get your kid to calm down. None of that. Just <laughs> just happy to have us. I'm really going to miss that place. And I, I haven't even told Rainier yet. I'm not sure how he's going to react. Aww. Aww. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, I've actually never been to a Sherry's, but one uh, holiday season, a mutual friend dropped off a pie as a thank you for a gift we gave him. They were like, hey, pick from this list. So we were like, oh, we'll just get this Marion Berry cheesecake, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best pie. Like, we still talk about this pie. <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard that the food, like, in general is not, you know, it's like Denny's quality Cisco. It's not that great. But yeah. let me tell you, that pie was so good that mm -hmm. whenever we would drive by a Sherry's, we'd go, remember that pie? <laughs> 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 we should get another pie. Never did. But, like, when I think of Sherry's, I'll always think of that pie. And I'm um, also, I know this, this means that the Oregon Lottery is going to have a lot of available video lottery terminals because they're going to be vacating them. I just wanted to like publicly notify them that I'm currently building a waterproof shed in my backyard and I'm happy <laughs> to host one. I even have a power source. I'm also happy to leave a cooler full of beer and or pie for visitors to get. <gasps> Too soon. You know, I'm in the lottery mood. I really hope they follow up with me. I really want that commission. <laughs> That's a sick plan for the wintertime. Right? That's going to work out great Come for you. Claudia's shed. Claudia's shed. Pretty <laughs> ladder shed. That's so questionable. <laughs> All right. On to the news of the week. Brianna, you're going to be doing us a solid and breaking down one of the only measures we haven't really investigated on the show, Measure 119. Uh, Late on us, pros, cons, I want to hear it all. 
Yes. Thank you for saving this for me. I really appreciate you sticking this on the back burner (laughs) for the two and a half minutes that I've been away. So (laughs) if passed, Measure 119 is going to make it possible for workers in the cannabis field to unionize. It, uh, It was spearheaded by the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 555, and they did that via a signature campaign which I mean, just props. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, because of super vague federal laws, I think we're all familiar with like hemp being legal, cannabis being illegal. This is this weird gray area because they're the same plant, two different phenotypes. It's just messy, 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 messy. So because of the, the messiness of these laws, cannabis workers are often denied, straight up denied the right to unionize, which is wild because that is a huge industry in Oregon. So under... Ballot Measure 119, uh, cannabis employers would be required to sign a labor peace agreement with a labor union before they receive a license from the OLCC. Hmm. So in that agreement, employers must agree simply not to interfere with organizing efforts if their employees choose to unionize, right? So cannabis employees, it's a spectrum, right? You you might work in cultivating, uh, harvesting, processing. And in between all of these different jobs, all of these different positions, you could be exposed to wild chemicals. You could be denied proper protective equipment. Many workers are dealing with hazardous working conditions. Ask 12 people that work in the cannabis industry, and six of them will tell you that when they've spoken up about, you know, kind of shitty working conditions, they have they felt like they were going to lose their jobs. Very freaking uncool. So OPB talks to Miles Ishaya, now, that's a spokesperson for Local 555, mm-hmm. and it, it's worth saying that that is Oregon's largest private sector labor union. Woohoo! So, Miles says, quote, we don't want them to be exposed to toxic chemicals if they don't need to be. We want them to negotiate their own safety and working conditions because that's only fair. Okay, so earlier this summer, the union spends over $2 million on this signature campaign, and they qualify for the ballot. There are over 7,000 workers in the cannabis field. So if passed, Measure 119 is going to give these workers in the industry the right to unionize, unless the worker is classified solely as an agricultural worker. And that's because agricultural laborers are not protected, and mm-hmm. they are not allowed to unionize under a different act, the National Labor Relations Act, which is just a whole other can of worms. Similar to um, ballot measure 119, those are they're already on the books in states like California, New York, New York, and New Jersey. In a way, we're playing catch up, uh, which is also wild because we um, decriminalized cannabis in the 70s. We were really prepared to have this like robust, amazing cannabis industry. Uh, so measure 119 is really going to like bolster that ideal for us. Mm. And it, it's not the first time. Uh, in case listeners are like, well, didn't I, haven't I heard something about this but quite a few years ago? Yes, you did. You heard about this in 2023 when we were talking about House Bill 3183. That bill died because at that time there was still a lot of conversation about the legitimacy of recreational cannabis versus medicinal versus hemp versus THC, da 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 da. Mm-hmm. Very messy, lots of gray areas. Another thing I found interesting about this was the connection to LaModa, which a lot of us know is. The same company that former Secretary of State Shamia Fagan was working for when she resigned because she was caught in a situation where there was some undisclosed conflict of interest in her role as an auditor. But the point is, is that when I was doing some research on like what kind of workers complaints would come up within the cannabis industry, LaModa popped up right away. And some examples of complaints are unpaid wages, but also unsafe working conditions due to regular armed robberies. Mm -hmm. So some pretty serious shit. And what's Mm -hmm. interesting, too, is that in last year's legislative session that Brianna mentioned, they were hoping that this bad press around LaModa and Shamia Fagan would help push this bill along. But it still died because of that perception that Brianna was talking about of how complicated everything is, that it's not a very clear system. Yeah. Well, one another thing, the reason why HB 3183 was also squashed um, is because it like required just the way it was written, employers to surrender rights protected by federal law, meaning that they would Mm -hmm. be able to offer information to employees about an organizing effort. Like, hey, instead of organizing, how about we do this? Mm. That would be considered interference. And so 
employers were just like, well, that's our federal right. Like we can offer alternatives or whatever. So I was curious. I looked in and I think that they tried to correct that in this bill. So Mm -hmm. that's why there's not a like the employers are like, cool, as long as we get to keep our federal rights cool. Like we're good yeah. here. But I, to add to what you were saying, Julia, mm-hmm. data from the police bureau showed 33 robberies were reported at cannabis businesses in the first half of 2023, a number higher than the annual totals each year from 2016 to 2022, meaning like it's just getting worse. Yeah, And I'm sure you probably heard this too, Julia, earlier this month, just blocks from where I live, a retail cannabis worker in St. John's killed two armed robbers. They had robbed him at gunpoint, allowed him to leave. He returned with a gun and shot them through a window. It's a very excessive and illegal, but getting robbed by gunpoint sounds so scary. And it yeah. appears to be happening so frequently that people are snapping and people are dying. Yeah. No, and I've been to that dispensary that you're talking about, Claudia. Like that's another thing too, is that it can involve civilians. The whole thing needs to have some sort of protections around it because it's just wild west very unsafe for workers Mm -hmm. yeah but here we are with 119 it's a brand new day so is there opposition not really the cannabis industry alliance of oregon is the advocacy and lobbying group for cannabis retailers and they're not supporting or opposing the measure Mm -hmm. um in fact the board chair of that organization He's quoted by OPB uh, he's saying the owners of these businesses are not antagonistic to labor organizing. That's not who we are. This is I love this part. The vast majority of us have worked on that side of the fence as well. We understand the critical role that a healthy workforce and strong protections for the workforce plays. I love that. Yeah. Is there criticism of 119? Well, sort of. The main criticism is that Adding additional paperwork and cost to cannabis businesses overburdens the struggling industry. The bottom line is that currently the right to unionize is afforded at the federal level to all employees, including those who work in cannabis. Huh? But because of confusion around federal and state laws pertaining to cannabis, many workers faced issues when they're trying to unionize. Measure 119 would effectively close this loophole. It would ensure all workers, except for the agricultural workers that I mentioned, will have the right to unionize. Well, it seems like it's a no-brainer. Yes on 119. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how I feel. It's like, well, done. I mean, if yeah. like the entire industry is basically behind it, except for like, mm, that paperwork, you know, like. <laughs> I know. That's like the main pushback. Oh, it's too much paperwork. Like, you know, yeah. uh, we can get around that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Brianna, for breaking that down. We really appreciate it. Uh, Let's take a quick break here. When we come back, more headlines of the week. This episode is brought to you by Mubi, a global streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema. Stream beautiful hand-picked films anytime, anywhere. And be sure to catch the cult classic The Fall, now streaming exclusively on Mubi in a spectacular new 4K restoration. Filmed across 24 countries over a period of four years, Tarsim Singh's ostentatious epic sees a bedridden stuntman played by a magnetic Lee Pace spin an escapist fantasy for a hospitalized young girl. The story transports her into the exotic landscapes of her imagination, backdropped by magnificent costumes and stunning locations. So don't miss your chance to experience this film like never before. You could start streaming the fall and more for 30 days free at Mubi.com forward slash CityCast. That's M-U-B-I dot com forward slash CityCast. Did you know you can find the best deals at the Habitat for Humanity Portland Region Restores? You can shop for new and gently used furniture, appliances, lighting, building materials, decor, home goods, and more, all at discounted prices of 25 to 75% off. Let me say that again. That's 25 to 75% off your favorite home and furniture brands. And bonus, every purchase helps fund local Habitat home building and home repair programs. Plus, you're shopping sustainably at the 
the ReStore by giving pre-loved items new life and keeping usable items out of our local landfills. Shop online or in-store at the ReStore locations in Beaverton, Gresham, and Portland. The ReStores are open seven days a week. Visit pdxrestore.org to find a ReStore near you. And there you can shop, save, and give back today. This week, I wanted to give a little update on Commissioner Renee Gonzalez's ongoing Wikipedia gate. I relied on reporting from Oregonian, KGW, and OPB, along with Portland Mercury. If you're familiar with the backstory, Gonzalez, who we all know is, is running for mayor, hired an outside contractor to spruce up his Wikipedia page earlier this summer, yeah. which are all totally fine things to do. But unfortunately, he was caught using taxpayer dollars to do so, 6400 to be exact. We actually <laughs> talked about it on a Friday roundup in August. Brianna, you were actually the guest on the show. I was just <laughs> crapping all over that Wikipedia story. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Shane Dixon Kavanaugh from the Oregonian originally broke the story. And even though there were only like eight or so edits that uh, Gonzalez's chief of staff confirmed they had requested, once Shane's story went live, his Wikipedia page was bombed by tech-savvy <laughs> Portlanders. And we got such gems as his title being changed to dork and his <laughs> subheading as the worst. <laughs> and, okay, and, and on the list, of, let me just remind you, the list of updates he wanted done were kind of minor. The most notable was he wanted to scrub mention of his Twitter shout out, which he said was accidental, to a Patriot prayer member who is a group closely affiliated with white nationalists and total asshats. He also wanted a uh, mention of his Mexican-American heritage to be made more prominent, and he wanted his political party affiliation to be listed. Never forget, he's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Generally, he just wanted to distance himself from seeming Republican or just like right-leaning in any politics. And that, what I just told you, uh, was the clincher because initial investigation into the matter from the city auditors said he was clear from violating campaign mm -hmm. finance laws, but they did bookmark that it needed a deeper dive. And they're like, the state needs to come in. Like, we don't have the resources right now. Like, this doesn't seem good. So they did a deeper dive. And that resulted in Gonzalez and his campaign being issued a fine for 2400 which is honestly not enough, being that he spent no. 6400 of yeah. our taxpayer money oh, yeah. on what clearly was a you know, campaign cost. So here's a quote from the auditor's office press release. The role of commissioner in Portland is nonpartisan. Therefore, the funds and time spent on his Wikipedia edit is unrelated to Gonzalez's city duties or accomplishments as a city commissioner. Notably, when asked, Gonzalez could not identify any reason why a Wikipedia edit pertaining to a status as a Democrat related to city business. <laughs> <laughs> the auditor's officer also faulted Gonzalez for interfering in the review. Portland Mercury reported that Gonzalez staff staffers Shaw Smith and Harrison Cass, a current city council candidate in District 3, by the way, lied to auditors when they were asked for documents from prior emails as a part of a records request related to the investigation. Mm -hmm. Auditors were particularly interested in an email Cass sent to White Hat Wiki, which was the contractors they hired, that provided a scan of the marked up version of the Wikipedia page with all the edits they requested, because if they didn't have that request, they literally would have to dig through all the edits manually on Wikipedia. And I can imagine that would have been insanely time consuming after his Wiki page got edit bombed back in August, because I sat there while it was happening and it was insane, you know? <laughs> Before I tell you more on how Gonzalez's team responded, what do you guys think? Uh, uh, this has just continued to be more and more embarrassing yeah. to see for, for Gonzalez. Sorry. Just got to gotta call it for what it is. Because the thing is, is like you add up the fines and the amount that he paid to get the changes made to begin with. That's like nearly nine grand to try to make himself look good. I'll say that. That he could have done for free, first of all. Yeah. Could have just done it himself for free, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't have caused this kind of bad press around his name. Mm -hmm. So, just bad calls all around. Literal countdown until he's trying to pay somebody to fix what just happened to Wikipedia and what is going on now. <laughs> what oh what do we say? Like, how much you guys got? Uh, you think he learned? Do you think no. he learned? I don't know. This is what's so sad <laughs> is that, like, you know, he worked as an attorney. Like, he's not a dumb individual. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking is like these are just not based decisions. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Like these aren't 
this isn't the decision making of like someone that I would be like, oh, we should give him more money and power. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. What are you saying, Claudia? (laughs) What are you saying? Oh, oh, I'm just saying. Okay, well, see, also, this isn't the first time Commissioner Gonzalez has been caught violating campaign finance laws. When he was running for city council a couple years back, he was fined $77,000 for accepting steeply discounted rent on his downtown campaign office from Schnitzer Properties. Do you remember that? $77,000? He was fined. But a state administrative law judge ended up revoking all the fines, saying that the city did not offer enough evidence on the going rate of the space. Mm. And they're just like, yeah, there's not enough receipts here for that. So the fact that he paid $200 a month for a prime downtown, we're just going to pretend that's fine. Anyhow, according to the city (laughs) auditor's office, another way uh, Gonzalez's team obstructed the investigation, this current one with the Wikipedia, was by requesting Reed Broderson, who's the chief deputy auditor, who issued the initial and most current findings to be removed from the investigation alleging Mm. political bias. Here's the tea. The Oregonian (laughs) reported earlier this month that Broderson uh, was in a longtime romantic relationship and still owns a home with Andres Oswell. That's the board chair of Portland for All. And that's the progressive advocacy group that sought the election probe into Gonzalez's possible campaign violation and also supports rival candidate Commissioner Carmen Rubio for Portland mayor. But according to Broderson, which is so sad that he has to do, he's like, we're no longer together. (laughs) Also, also it was Jackie Yerby, this other person who submitted the initial complaint to the elections division, which who was another volunteer on on the Portland for All board. And Broderson noted he had no relationship or personal familiarity with Jackie Yerby. Was it discussed in the board? Did Andres have any say? Did they give a heads up to Burson? Who the freak knows? <laughs> you know? Who the freak knows? I don't know why I decided not to cuss just that. <laughs> I don't know why that was the line for me. But <laughs> elections manager Deborah Scroggin defended the decision to keep up Broderson as the chief investigator. Uh, this Monday, the Oregonian quoted her as saying, across the nation, elections officials find themselves under attack and paid it as politically motivated when they are simply performing their jobs as local bodies or the public have asked them to do. The auditor's office is committed to nonpartisan independent oversight and conducts thorough, timely investigations as required by city law. And I also just think that most of us we're already concerned about Gonzalez using tax money <laughs> for what clearly mm-hmm. appeared to be his mayoral campaign. But none of us were going to be like, I beg your finest pardon. Like, none of us were going to do it. So <laughs> the fact that somebody did, I'm like, yeah, someone should freaking look into this. Like, geez. But yeah, in the process of investigating, you know, Gonzalez being like, who's who's after me? He like found out the two guys broke up. Like, I don't <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> it's just so sad. I understand why the Oregon had to look into Can it. Can I tell like, you my favorite quote from this whole thing? Of course. This is it for me. <laughs> so in Jamie's article, Gonzalez is quoted saying this about the whole thing. It's a distraction from the important work we need to do to move Portland forward, which I find is hilarious because one could say that the edits he was making to his Wikipedia page and the taxpayer <laughs> funds that he was spending on that were a distraction from the important work we need to do to move Portland forward. So. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. All yeah. right. That's all I got. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my gosh. But he's got a great head of hair. But the hair. <laughs> it's a salt and pepper that I wish I had. And I can never achieve is what I'm saying. <laughs> Let it go, Claudia. <laughs> so Let <nice>. it go. <laughs> well, let's take another break here. And when we return, more headlines of the week. This is an ad for better help. Welcome to the world. Please read your personal owner's manual thoroughly. In it, you'll find simple instructions for how to interact with your fellow human beings and how to find happiness and peace of mind. Thank you and have a nice life. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with an owner's manual. That's why there's BetterHelp Online Therapy. Connect with a credentialed therapist by phone, video, or online chat. Visit betterhelp.com to learn more. That's betterhelp.com. The new Apple Watch Series 10 is here. It has the biggest display ever. It's also the thinnest Apple Watch ever, making it even more comfortable on your wrist. And it's the fastest charging Apple Watch, getting you eight hours of charge in just 15 minutes. Introducing the all new Apple Watch Series 10, now available for the first time in glossy jet black aluminum. 
Compared to previous generation, iPhone XS or later required. Charge time and actual results will vary. All right, Julie, what caught your eye this week? All right. So my story comes from some reporting by Sophie Peel at Willamette Week, Alex Zielinski at OPB, and Austin De Dios at The Oregonian. And I'm talking about Portland city leaders wanting to pull out of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Exciting stuff. So some quick context for listeners who are like, what even is the Joint Office? Um, it's a Multnomah County and City of Portland jointly funded office that works to address the ongoing homelessness crisis in Multnomah County. And the office was formed in 2016 because the county and the city have always had overlapping responsibilities when it comes to addressing homelessness issues. So the idea was just, it made sense to get everybody on the same page under the same office, right? But currently within the office, the county has control over the budget and administration while the city advises how to spend the money. And surprise, surprise, it hasn't been that simple. In fact, in Zelensky's reporting from the summer, there's a quote from a PSU director of homelessness research that captures the ongoing tension really well. And they said, quote, you can't have joint oversight over something when mom and dad aren't getting along, which I think is spot on. Because for years now, there has been tension within the office on who calls the shots. In 2020, Mayor Ted Wheeler threatened to pull out of the joint office unless the county opened more shelter beds. Then two years later, the county shut down city plans for a large-scale outdoor shelter made up of just tents. Which brings us back to Sophie Peel's headline, which digs into how, just last week, current city commissioners Renee Gonzalez, Mangus Maps, and Dan Ryan all said they want the city to pull out of the joint office and they're drafting a request to vote on it, from what we know as of right now. And that received a lot of criticism from leaders across our state. Governor Tina Kotek claimed the situation was, quote, obstructionist infighting, and County Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson called it out as just a way for the three of them, who are running for positions in this election, to grab more votes. So brutal review on all fronts, but the thing is, is I can totally understand the criticism um, which I want to get into, but before I jump into that, initial reactions from both of you. How is this sitting, this whole situation that seemingly keeps coming up? That quote that you pulled really summed it up perfectly. The mom and dad. When mom and dad are fighting. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to understand why agree to sign the contract three months ago if you're just going to get out of it. Like, Well, that's the thing, right? Like, They just renegotiated their partnership in the joint office when they signed that contract. And it was just back in June. So it feels like we all just went through this. And the thing is, is that I think they anticipated this coming up again because they put within that contract that if the city ever wanted to pull out, all they had to do was give the county a 90 days notice and there wouldn't be a financial penalty. Mm -hmm. And the thing is also that makes it especially frustrating is that Gonzalez and Maps, their complaints didn't come with any sort of recommendations for reform. And then Ryan had some loose ideas for reform that aren't even possible within the office's current funding structure. So they basically were like, we don't want this and we have no idea what we want instead. I I just want to know, I wonder, okay, I wonder if anything set them off because I, I personally don't want to believe that all three grown men are just throwing like a weird political tantrum as JVP um, pointed that they're possibly doing. Not one of them has offered a plan, like you said. Uh, so like, what happened? Like, what was going on that all three of them were like, yes, we're going to do this, even though it's going to set everything back, you know, because Maps and Gonzalez have no experience managing anything like this either. Also, mm -hmm. why do this just weeks before the election? Like, that's a that day part. shift thrashing the kitchen for the night shift. Exactly. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> metaphor. Right? Like, it's lacking not only all common sense, like, why would you do that? We all work here. It's also just plain rude. Like, this is rude. rude. <laughs> like, when I had mm -hmm. this, I, I got a Stephanie Tanner. Where are your manners? I know. I, I was like, how rude, you guys? How rude? <laughs> well, you're right. You know what? Like, that metaphor extends beyond just right now, because anything that City Hall does won't even be their issue their immediate issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of this is going to get passed down to new administration, the 12 yep. new city councilors and the new mayor come January. Mm -hmm. So if Ryan Gonzalez and Maps don't get voted in, they're like, bye, y'all can deal with this now. Like they really don't have a stake in the game. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's fair to believe some of what Kotek and Jessica Vega Peterson are saying, where it seems a little bit like trying to draw attention to themselves yeah. to show that they are 
people of action around this issue that everybody's talking about before they go and fill their ballots. Yeah, because as I mean, the Oregonian also just put out a poll where most of of Portland is not that stoked about Jessica Vega Peterson or, you know, JVP, as we call around here Mm -hmm. um, and her actions and her leadership. Essentially, they're really mad at the county for what they think is a failure in providing the services that Portlanders need. Um, So I can see like if that is the popular thought being like, you know, uh, candidates to be like, county bad, county bad with no city, (laughs) county bad. Vote now, me? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? But it's just like, no, that's not how... Governing works. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't just do you don't you think I would love to go in a room and be like, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like we still gotta work together. Yeah. And not only that, there are also like stats that are showing things are getting better. Mm. It's incremental, like you know, but we're making progress. Why shoot everybody in the foot now? Yeah. And we are on the precipice of things hopefully continuing to get better because we do have those uh, drug deflection centers starting to open up. So we haven't seen the full impact of what that will look like when people have access to that resource, right? And the one thing I will say, too, is just to dig a little bit more into Dan Ryan's idea for reform, he was suggesting that the joint office basically hand over money from the supportive housing services tax, which is something that was passed in a measure back in 2021. And Granted, it has brought in a lot more revenue than anticipated, which I think is funny because it seems like the city is always doing things like that. They're always like, we have all this money we don't know what to do with. But the point is, is it's illegal for that money to be passed over to the city as is. And in order for that to happen ever in the future, it would have to be voted on and renegotiated. And that wouldn't be even touched until May. So his best idea at this point was to do something that's not even possible, which is so frustrating. Yeah. And just to uh, what you were saying, basically the Metro SHS dollars, you know, supportive money, that uh, (laughs) that money is the bulk of what funds the joint office is from. Yes. So it's Mm -hmm. if the city were fully funding it, I would be like, they might have a point here, guys. Because it's tying up resources, it's tying up money that we need. We could put somewhere else. Right. If the bulk of the money go- is coming elsewhere, we c- can't have access to that funds unless we work together. You know, come on. Well, that's spot on, Claudia. Within this year's current budget, the county contributed sixty-seven percent of the joint office's overall budget, and the city dollars only made up fourteen percent. So I feel like the way that the roles are distributed right now kind of makes sense. I don't know if that's necessarily conducive of a healthy work environment or getting things done, but I can see why things are structured the way they are right now. Well, Julia, thank you for breaking this down. I feel like this has been something that everybody at one point has been like, I don't know about signing this because we're not seeing the the results we want to see. or You're not working with us in the way that we want to be worked with. And I totally get it. Like I get that. To be honest, like, I feel like this is like my base reaction if I'm upset is totally like, well, fuck you. I'm going home. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's just like that, like taking my ball and going home. It's like, fuck you. I'm going to Sherry's. (laughs) (laughs) You can't do that anymore. We're all grown adults with jobs now. We can't all just take our ball and go to Sherry's, you know? (laughs) As much as I want to. <laughs> and eat pie and just go to Shirai's and hang out. Play, the lottery. play video lottery. We can't do that. We all have nope. to work together, especially on, when we don't have money. <laughs> Come on, people. Oh, man. All right. Well, you guys, thank you so much for hanging out, going through some of the headlines of the week. Brianne and Julia, always a pleasure. Um, man, I think I'm going to eat some pie this weekend. Mary and Barry Cheesecake. Let's do it in honor of Shirai's. For Sherry. For Shirai's. For Shirai's. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thank you so much for listening. Our executive producer is John Atariani. Our producers this week were Julia Fiaioni and Francisco Kilgore. Our Hey Portland newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, And our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.